the work, the work uh, with the, with the, the Bob's group has, I think it's really the top of the game, it's the best in the world. But, uh, there's a really great uh, discussion and analysis of this going on. And I really think that this opportunity to bring these uh, two, two dimensions together will benefit both here. And us in Hollywood, I know already that it has helped a lot. Well, that's very kind of you, Exile. I'm honored to be here and honored to be on the same program with my two colleagues whose work I've admired for a long time and whose work I assign in my courses on rethinking capitalism. So this is a, a great opportunity for us to exchange views and to explore our, our differences and possible agreements. Politically, this talk is, is motivated by a simple observation. In 2008, the suicide bombers on Wall Street threatened to blow up the financial system and themselves along with it, unless the US government was willing to swap assets that under market to market measures had to be valued at zero and that got swapped at 100 cents on the dollar. Now in the final analysis, no one, and that includes most of my friends, was willing to call their bluff. In the same way that in the final analysis, no one here in Greece <laughs> was willing to call a similar bluff. The goal of government policy, I fear overwhelmingly supported by the public, was simply to prolong what we had as long as possible by treating the financial crisis that occurred in 2008 and that is still occurring here as a liquidity crisis. Not because the economy was a natural, stable, and self-correcting system, but rather because it wasn't any of these things. And because being inherently fragile, being inherently vulnerable to sabotage, the economy needed to be prolonged and preserved at all costs, by which I mean austerity by any means necessary, even if the result would foreseeably be to make the economy even less just than it was before. Now what the economists, what the terrorists, I should say, on Wall Street revealed to us in 2008 was how little it would take to bring the system down. What they revealed to us was thus the close relation between the security of financial markets and the repression of its underlying sources of insecurity by political means, by military means, by clandestine means, by any means necessary. They reveal, moreover, that the valuation of securities that are pledged as collateral for each other presupposes that they, whoever they are, have the legal right to repossess by whatever force is necessary, by whatever means are necessary, assets that we, whoever we are, already hold in our hands. In other words, the power that they exercise to force governments to give them everything they want is also power in our hands to exercise against them as forms of resistance, resistance, the repression of which requires greater and greater austerity on the part of the government and greater and greater fear <clears throat> on all of our parts. Now, as a lesson from this defeat, I think we can begin to see something about capitalism itself as primarily a distinctive technology for producing prices. It produces goods as a means of producing prices. That's how it imagines itself. That's what the fetishism of commodities is. And what we can see now is that capital is a technology for producing prices based essentially on its ability to price the generic form of an investment, which I regard not as the commodity form but as I'll explain 
at great lengths, perhaps too great lengths, this has to <laughs> the, the option form, the option form. So in my paper, I think it's worth regarding what I have to say about capitalism in the context of what Marx said about it. I think that finance is what we call capitalism from the totalizing standpoint of the investor. And that capitalism is what we should call finance when seen as a site of state intervention or of social struggle, which is also a totalizing perspective. So what I'm going to try to do, however briefly, is to engage in some perhaps friendly, but perhaps a little bit oppositional dialogue with my friends on this panel by talking about the way in which finance has become an organizing metaphor for the world that supersedes commodification. So that what we have in effect today is a form of real subsumption of non-waged labor into the logic of finance to the extent that you see yourself as having a funding problem, as I was talking to Anna about a moment ago. You need money. And insofar as you need money, you think of yourself not merely as the owner of your skills as an artist, but as somebody with a portfolio of attributes and assets that can be hedged, that can be swapped out. You are no one thing in particular. You are a bundle of individual identities who individuate yourself at particular points in time when you decide to cash in or liquidate. So in my work and in my political practice, and I, I, I've been a union president for 17 years in the University of California system, in my work I understand that all institutions, for example, universities, but also individuals, are undergoing increasingly a real subsumption, which is only apparent if we think of capitalism itself not merely as an industrial form of production, but as a financial mode of investment, a mode of investment that manufactures financial products that can be vehicles of accumulation, even if they are no longer functioning directly as produced means of production. This means that under situations of austerity, of decline in public funding, the interesting question is, what are your sources of funds? What are your uses of funds? My methodology in straightforward economic terms is to use sources and uses of funds data rather than GDP, GDP data, or as Copeland, rather than Simon Kuznets. Sorry, can you repeat that last bit? Morris Copeland rather than Simon Kuznets. There's no reason why you, you as economists would know these people anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but Kuznets won the Nobel Prize. <coughs> But the point is that under all under because okay. that's you know yes. yeah. okay. where the notion is here that under a financialized form of, of subsumption, manufactured anxiety about the future becomes a means of social control through creating a demand for financial literacy that makes you a customer for financial products that you buy increasingly in order to hedge against the lack of security that is created by the state at the behest of the very banks which then turn around and sell you the financial products that you are uh, encouraged to buy. My emergent claim, in other words, is that the convergence of capitalism with the overall logic of finance, which is no longer subordinate to the logic of production, and particularly industry, makes capitalism, as Marx described it, more like itself by moving us from logics of commodification and industrialization to the more metaphysical, I think more theological, logic of financial decision-making itself. 
At this point, the distinction between capitalism as a material process and capitalism as a cultural process becomes weaker and weaker. It comes to matter less. Yes, there is still free market fundamentalism. There is still efficient market fundamentalism. It is a financial fundamentalism, especially after the crash. I come to you from the University of Chicago. But that fundamentalism now only exists in the economics department and no longer in the business school. In fact, it has, like many other religious fundamentalisms at a time of challenge to religions, it has come to present itself as a kind of anti-dogmatic strategy for preserving what exists by concentrating on what really matters in the financial system, namely the fundamentals, when most other beliefs, like beliefs in forgiveness curves, and so on and so forth, have come under attack. Why concentrate on the fundamentals? Because the alternative is apocalypse, otherwise known as illiquidity. This is what we all must think, they now say, in the business school, which is right next to the building, the little shack in which my office exists. This is what we all must think, unless we either want to revert to some dogmatic belief in the self-correction of free markets, or else, or else, endure the apocalypse. The question now at the University of Chicago is whether capitalism must confess its own critique in order to be saved. <laughs> Capitalism's confession of ultimate uncertainty about everything, including its fundamental assumptions, has produced forms of praxis and habitus that resemble earlier religious defenses against ontological anxiety, but that are in no way self-evident and unavoidable. And so the political impetus behind my work is not how we can withdraw autonomously from the system and develop means of subsistence that are post-capitalist, that function in the way that once was uh, performed by means of subsistence that were pre-capitalist, that survived for a long time into capitalism and now in unwaged households will have to be created again. The real question is, given the heightened degree of uncertainty, what will we do now that we know how <laughs> fragile the system is? What will we do now that we know that its own fragility in the form of doubts about what it takes to maintain liquidity is built into the logic of the system itself and has become fundamental to this logic. This uncertainty about liquidity is simply another way of describing an underlying political contingency in capital markets. Risk is too weak a word. An underlying contingency which is that the revelation of its own contingency will be what saves the system. <coughs> which is, I think, a form, a secular form, of what Christianity accomplished toward the end of the Roman Empire. <laughs> the question now, in other words, is whether we want to hasten that future collapse rather than prolonging what we have for just a little longer because we are afraid of what comes next. Do we want to treat our politics as just another form of hedging what do we do now that we know that capitalism itself has confessed its own critique as the ultimate last reason why we should all be afraid to see it go? Why capitalism itself, in other words, has confessed its ultimate dependency on the production of confusion and fear, which takes the form of knowledge. Now with this in mind, I want to state that I'm not an economist. If anything, I'm a philosopher and a Marx scholar. And my goal as a philosopher and a Marx scholar is to lay the foundation 
for a politics of critical finance based on restating Marx in the conceptual register of modern financial theory, the Black-Scholes model, and particularly the Black-Scholes way that which the Black-Scholes model is a way of institutionalizing its uncertainty about itself. In other words, I'm trying to light. This woman. I am trying to bring light <laughs> to the debates of Marxism by viewing, by viewing Marxism as a renewable, as a renewable project rather than a cultural exercise in nostalgia or steampunk. The key, I think, is to take a half step away from David Graeber's emphasis on debt over the past 5,000 years, in which capitalism is but a blip, and look instead at the more interesting concept of liquidity. And especially, and this is where I have some disagreement with Andrea's and the finance book, especially on the importance of the liquidity of debt alongside money as a foundation for creating financial products which are not part of the real economy of goods and services. I want to regard debt as something no less important to a Marxian analysis of capitalism than the exploitation of wage labor, which is indeed complementary to debt. And I want to regard the liquidity of debt as fundamental to its raison d'etre, its reason for being, as a raw material in creating other financial products. I believe that financial products are created out of debt, plus information, cognitive capital. Liquidity is precisely the property that financial assets have when they can be priced without being turned into money. And they can be priced without being turned into money by stripping off the risk of not being able to price it through by, 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 by pricing instead options that can be turned into money when the asset cannot be. The liquidity of an asset is thus distinct from its liquidation value, which is essentially the difference created by the premium paid for the option and the asset itself. The liquidation value, in other words, is the cash that a lender could get out of the commodity by selling the collateral in the event of the non-performance of the existing revenue stream. So what I'm going to do today is essentially to talk about Marx as a philosophy based on really two kinds of spread. One, the traditional spread described by Duncan Foley between the money value of labor and the labor value of money, which is the labor theory of value, and it's really a labor theory of the value of money. And secondly, in the production of financial assets, the spread between it, the liquidity of the asset at its market price and its liquidation value, which is the conversion into money of the collateral for that asset. I want to do this in a way that allows us to grasp the fundamental theorem of finance, as Marx describes it, at two levels. MCM prime, I don't have to write this on the board, as something where C is both labor power at the level of the production of commodities, but C is also an investment portfolio at the level of assets. So that what Marx calls the realization problem is the problem of realizing your investment in assets by turning it into money. And what I want to show you today is that once we add the asset form to the commodity form in Marxist philosophy, the interesting thing is that financial assets can be produced without engaging in the labor theory of value. Why? Because the realization problem 
your inability to get a return on your investment in raw materials is precisely what can be hedged, which is why there is finance. In other words, the hedge adds value. So, with this in mind, let me just try to speak Marx in the language of Black Scholes, in the language of finance, and see if I can make sense of lots of things that I think have been talked about in, in different ways by, by my two co-panelists. Uh, but without necessarily staying within a purely productionist version of Marxism. In other words, within a productionist version of Marxism, these concepts of alternative currency are basically ways of removing from the function of money for transactional purposes all of the properties that make it valuable for financial purposes, including the basic fact most famously discovered by Keynes, the dirty secret of money is that it doesn't have to be spent. You're trying to create money that does have to be spent. And the fact that money doesn't have to be spent is what causes the realization problem, which is what causes the demand for an option, which would hedge against the decline in the value of your raw materials if people stop spending money, for example. So it's important to understand, I think, that money works in these other ways without in any way detracting from the possibility that you could recreate some of the virtues of a subsistence economy in the manner suggested by people who are talking about alternative, paying people, paying people uh, basic social income using alternative currencies. It's a way of creating a subsistence form of money. So here goes Marx with Black Scholes. Well, it all begins with the figure that Adam Smith describes as the farmer. But the farmer that Adam Smith describes is decidedly not Thomas Jefferson's yeoman farmer who owns the land he works, who plants the seed he grows, and who then sells the portion of the crop that he doesn't eat on an open market sharing the proceeds with no one. Smith's farmer rather operates in the interstices of a feudal class society. Potentially, he rents his land, he buys the seed, and he hires landless labor to grow the crop, and then he sells the crop, subject to whatever obligations he has incurred to finance his investment. In other words, the whole point of capitalism as a mode of production is that it is a mode of production that, at least in the abstract and in theory, is self-funded. It is a mode of production that can be financed. It is not necessary for the capitalist to own the means of production, provided that he can finance his ability to rent the means of production. The question of whether he owns the means of production then becomes whether owning the means of production becomes a vehicle for preserving the surplus that he could have created by borrowing the money to rent the means of production. So for capitalism to occur, and this is a terribly important point, the great institutional and legal obligation, or innovation, is precisely that you can, call out, you can borrow against your crop. For capitalism to occur, the crop must already be collateral even before it has been produced as a commodity. The consequence of borrowing against the crop is that the creditor then has the right to purchase the crop or to acquire the crop in return for the note, for the value of the note, leaving the farmer with a contingent claim on the value that would exceed what was borrowed. What the farmer has, in other words, the solution to the mystery of surplus value, why somebody gets an unlimited upside, is simple. Once you understand what a call option is, what the farmer has 
is a call option, or rather a share of the call option, which is something that he can sell. He can sell other shares, other calls on the surplus value, which gives him a second way other than borrowing. Selling stock to finance production. So as byproducts of capitalist agriculture, as byproducts of a mode of production through the market of foodstuffs, Smith's capitalist farmer has also immediately manufactured two specific financial byproducts for which there is yet no market. And those financial byproducts are now known as debt and equity. Whether or not, am I going too fast? You can follow me. Whether or not there is a market, whether or not you can recycle these pollutants that are thrown off by capitalist agriculture, debt and equity, will depend upon how easily and transparently they can be traded and priced. But Marx's scientific view is that the capitalist did not have to own, in a feudal sense, any of the means of production in order to be entitled to appropriate a surplus if debt and equity, even if there was no market for them, were thrown off as byproducts of the system. Even if that is to say, he initially rents the means of production. So that even if this is the case, it is essential to a market-based mode of production that someone other than the feudal lord who really did own the means of production and who rents it to the capitalist would have the right to appropriate surplus value without exchange, which as I've said is simply a call option. At its innermost kernel then, capitalism as described by Smith and Ricardo suggests that there is an outside to the market for commodities as such that is also more inside the market than the market itself, and that is the right to appropriate surplus value without exchange in just the way that the owner of a home option actually does every day in the market. So this inside-outside is the very thing that the capitalist always already possesses, which is the ability to manufacture a financial asset, which is a derivative of the commodity, based on the present value of something that does not yet exist. The market, then, is what describes itself as a machine for spatializing time by bringing the future into the present which is what allows some to accumulate benefits over time at the expense of another. In other words, the presumed liquidity of the market functions within the initial state of capital development as its equivalent to the commons. Before there is a market, there is liquidity. Group, which is the function that the commons that the commons has. So what makes the accumulation process continuously vulnerable in Marxist theory is that there is simply no good investment vehicle for hedging. That is to say, for preserving what you have other than by hoarding it or by expanding production, or buying more capitalist good. In his best moments then, Marx understood that his book called Capital was about production for accumulation, which is why he didn't call the book the commodity, although that is most self-evidently its topic. His choice was to stress that commodity production has to be financed and that the emergent logic of finance, which is based on non-arbitrage, will eventually come to dominate the process of production. But it's important to understand precisely how this works in Marx. Uh, 
absolute surplus value, as Marx describes it, is simply the labor theory of value that he took from Smith and Ricardo. Value expands by expanding the market for consumer goods that the producers purchase, which means that absolute value operates by expanding labor force participation and results in a steady state after full employment, even when greater specialization leads to falling prices. Now to reframe Marx's argument in this way, we, we, we need to understand what he himself made of finance given the state of capital development at that time. Because what he points out is that Smith and Ricardo actually acknowledged that there was no bias in capitalism in favor of technologies that economized on labor uh, or technologies that tried to maximize employment by economizing on capital. Steady state is steady state and it arises at full employment. And whatever effect there might be on the riches of nations, the wealth of nations is not affected no matter which way you get to steady state. For Marx, the genius of capitalism comes from his concept of relative surplus value, which is a huge advance on Smith and Ricardo. And here I'm trying to, to move beyond the kind of productionist framework that I, 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 that I think Andrea is struggling to retain, and, 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 and maybe Carlo as well. Relative surplus value is in essence an embryo of the finance argument. Marx's problem was to explain as Smith didn't need to do, the increased investment in labor-saving technology, an investment that de-skills labor uh, and leads to what Marx was the first to describe as structural unemployment, or in other words, a structurally surplus population that was essentially unwaged. And Marx's answer to the, this problem was essentially to use what in finance is now called the law of one price. The law of one price says, among other things, that the same commodity will sell at the same price regardless of how it is produced. So if you have a commodity like a pencil or a pen that contains a certain amount of wood and carbon, what the law of one price allows you to do, in addition to producing absolute surplus value by hiring labor, is to produce relative surplus value by harvesting an arbitrage opportunity on your cost of raw materials. It is a financial play, relative surplus value. If you think that speculative capital is fictitious, it is important to understand that you are rejecting an important, that, that, that so is the accumulation of a relative surplus value in the form of increased investments in increasingly labor saving, increasingly labor saving uh, machinery. So what it means to increase the productivity of labor is essentially to increase your ability to profit from your investment in raw materials because you are selling back that, those raw materials at a higher price relative to your cost of production than you would have with a lesser technology gradient. The historically transformative mission of capitalism, what makes it unlike other productive systems or political systems that have organized themselves around the division of labor, 
is that the commodification of labor produces absolute surplus value by increasing labor force participation. And the principle of arbitrage <coughs> creates relative surplus value out of investments in producer goods, allowing the capitalist and the principle of non-arbitrage lets you create a relative surplus value by increasing your investment in producer goods, allowing the capitalist to vastly increase output through investment in plant and materials relative to investment in labor power. It is moreover the logic of financial return alone and not the logic of the commodity form that creates what Marx will come to call in Capital Chapter 25, the general law of capital accumulation, which occurs for the first time in that volume and not, does not appear in Marx's earlier work. And this describes the creation of ever increasing constant capital alongside a growing surplus unemployed population. A population that is never going to be in aggregate fully employable and which is essentially unwaged and lives, lives in ways that Marx himself never actually explains. Marx's genius was precisely to show that under this particular moment of the development of a capitalist mode of production, producer goods, what he called constant capital, do double duty because they function both as means of production and as vehicles of accumulation. <coughs> In other words, physical capital is uniquely important at this stage in capital because Marx understood that there was no way of extracting what are essentially, essentially economic rents out of your purchase of raw materials except by expanding production. Except by expanding production. So here you have, and I regard this as an inspiration and a model for the kind of work I'm trying to do with finance today, here in the idea of the producer goods doing double duty in the manufacture of commodities, creating vehicles of accumulation at the same time that they are functioning as means of production, here you have a gear that models the kind of connection that my colleagues and I are trying to explore, explore between the growth of asset markets, in other words, the wealth of society, and the growth of commodity markets, in other words, the production of goods and services. Here you have, in embryonic form, the argument that uh, that's recently become very, very visible with the work of Thomas Piketty, that asset markets have a growth that is independent of the growth of the underlying economy. And in Marx, you have a brilliant, a brilliant example of precisely how this works, because you can begin to see, you can begin to see the dual function, the double duty that the produced means of production has as both the production of a capital good, a vehicle of asset preservation, and, 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 and a means of production, an abundance of things, an abundance of wealth. The final point then is that what we have here is essentially, essentially a way of interpreting Marx's general formula for capital that allows us to move forward by seeing that finance was already present in Marx's theory of relative surplus value, also in Marx's theory of turnover and how surplus, real surplus is created by turnover. 
which uh, does not require us to view the results of an arbitrage in investment goods as merely, merely fictitious, merely illusory. It is, it is, it is, it is, it is very much with, with, within Marx. And so, what I want to suggest, moving on to my, moving, looking forward to my, my general argument, is the debt in today's capitalist economy does the same double duty in the production of financial assets <coughs> that producer goods do with respect to the production of physical assets. And, 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 and this is where I'm going with this argument. But in order to, in order to, to, to develop the argument more precisely, because I'm a philosopher, not, not an economist, uh, so I, 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 I try to think about these things conceptually. The important point I want to make is that in MCM Prime, MCM Prime is simply a description of an arbitrage. It's a commodity selling at two different prices, which is what is supposed to be impossible. With the exception of labor power, which has to do with one kind of spread, or with the idea that what the capitalist <coughs> is investing in as a general formula of capital, C is a description of a portfolio. What Marx could not figure out because he lacked the full <coughs> conceptual apparatus that I'm trying to give to him is that the portfolio consisting of C consists of stock, of course, which is working capital, producing goods, raw materials, and the like. It consists of debt, which is money earning interest, so you have equity and debt. But what he didn't have is the idea that the portfolio could also, and did also implicitly, consist of puts and calls. He didn't have that because he didn't understand that puts and calls are the necessary ingredient which creates the liquidity of stocks and bonds and that the manufacture of puts and calls is a financial form of production that is non-redundant. It adds value to the economy but without adding to the production of goods and services. The idea here is very simple, and it explains MCM Prime. Namely, if you own a stock and the right to put the stock at a certain price that gives you downside protection, protection against a fall in the price, that is equivalent to owning a call on the stocks appreciating and a debt. <coughs> so by definition, and this is, this is finance is simply called the formula for put call parity, owning the stock but a down, with a downside protection is the equivalent of not owning a stock but having a, an option on its upside and a bond, so that you can solve, if you have puts and calls, you have financial products which are what makes your equity liquid, and it's also what makes your debt liquid. It's the liquidity of debt rather than the repayment of debt that is so important in thinking about debt as the raw material for the manufacture of financial products. A stock plus a put, which gives you the upside but not the downside, is equivalent to a call, which gives you the upside without owning the stock, plus a debt. So, yeah. Put call parity. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
So the formula is a simple accounting identity. Intuitively, it says that if you own a stock plus a put, giving you downside protection, you can replicate the investment return that you would have if you owned a call, which gave you upside participation, plus the present value of a loan that has a principal equivalent to the current stock price. Most importantly, the formula shows you that if you, that if you solve for debt, which is simply the amount that you would lend to the government, essentially, to get that return, you could use puts and calls to have a completely hedged stock portfolio that would be equivalent in return to the risk-free rate. So here you have a general theory of productive capital explaining MCM prime, which is Marx with finance. The problem is that when Marx wrote you couldn't manufacture and price puts and calls as a separate, as, as, as separate financial product. This is what has changed. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, no, it's good. This is what changed with the financial revolution in 1973. A financial revolution that occurs, by the way, Precisely after two decades of political upheaval, such as the Operisti, I mean, when, when Negri writes his book on Keynes, he regards the illiquidity of capital, the production of Minsky and crises, as, as a, a triumph of the workerist movement in Italy for the past 10 years, the collapse of capitalism in 1973. In the U.S., my teachers, my teachers in the government department at Harvard, Samuel Huntington, and people like that, regarded this as an excess of democracy that too many demands were being put on the welfare state. The revolution. Yeah, the trilateral commission, Michel Crozier, and so on and so forth. This was this was this was a victory, producing the the, the, the collapse of Bretton Woods. 1973 was, whether by coincidence or by historical necessity. The moment when this financial technology was developed to manufacture puts and calls, to manufacture puts and calls without speculating. The formula for pricing puts and calls that was published as the famous Nobel Prize winning Black Scholes paper is a formula that says, notwithstanding all the math, that the price of a call is the cost of hedging it. And that you can thus manufacture as many calls as you want without any exposure, because your cost is the cost of continuous hedging. I started out talking about Adam Smith's farmer. Let me talk about Black Shoals Hedge Fund. Black Shoals Hedge Fund is a company it has no assets other than the stock in other companies, which it buys entirely on borrowed money. And then the question is, since it has no other asset but its own stock, how does it produce a cash flow above the dividends on the stock that it owns? And the answer, it can manufacture it can manufacture calls on its own stock. <coughs> It can manufacture calls on its own stock. Eventually, it'll be able to manage, manufacture calls on any stock. The, 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 the genius of the paper is it shows how the company can manufacture calls on its own stock without increasing its risk exposure to its own stock, and thus generate a steady stream of cash by simply selling the calls at a price that does not expose it to the underlying risk of the stock and is, in fact, hedged in the way that its exposure to its own stock is not. This is a description of a financial mode of production which creates puts and calls which, pro which are the missing elements which are the missing elements that add the value in MCM prime if C is considered to be a portfolio consisting, as I said, of not merely debt and equity, which were the byproducts of capitalist production to begin with, 
but also puts and calls. Okay, are people following this? No, but we got lots of questions. <laughs> okay, so let me just. It's important. Let's, so let me just uh, take a break by coming back to the idea that I got from my distinguished panelist, Carlo, which is the idea of the becoming rent of profit, which uh, I may be interpreting differently than, 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 than you do. My claim is that finance is an expansion of the inherent function of rents in creating vehicles of capital accumulation. That finance is essentially based on creating rents using a logic which I regard as extractive rather than exploitative, okay? My claim is that in capital you make money from the gradient risk of not being able to monetize an illiquid investment. That the concept is essentially a financial concept. That is to say, not being able to turn an illiquid investment back into money. And this liquidity risk, which Marx is a kind of nervous tick throughout Capital Volume 3, calls the realization problem. Whenever something doesn't work, the realization problem is simply what economists mean by the market. Uh, you can't sell it. That's a realization problem. Let's call it a liquidity risk that could be hedged. Instead, this liquidity risk is what the option hedges by assigning that liquidity risk a present value and then allowing you to write a swap against it. it. In other words, it assigns a present value to a vehicle that produces liquidity now and because it is marketable, allows you to hedge the illiquidity of some other investments. So what I'm really arguing is that we get in financialized capitalism the production of vehicles of accumulation alongside commodities that require the production of other commodities in order for them to remain liquid. So this is hidden in Marx. But it is really an extension of the logic of economic rents from treating land as vehicles of accumulation to treating productive investments in the same way. In other words, and this is where I'll, I'll come at least to a partial close before, so that I can choose to begin to debate this. Absolute and relative rents in Negri's sense, precede absolute and relative surplus value. Originally, the vehicle of capital accumulation is land. The effect of the Smith-Ricardo account of the capitalist farmer is that you are employing more and more labor, in which case the fertility gradients of land for the purpose of feeding workers becomes more economically valuable, and land prices become the vehicle in which the surplus from agricultural production is accumulated, which creates the class conflict between the bourgeoisie as potential purchasers of land and the aristocracy, and leads to the paradox of the aristocracy getting richer as a result of the expansion of capitalist agriculture. Marx's genius was to show that the bourgeoisie gets richer using a similar logic because technology creates a gradient of return on your investment in raw materials. Not the labor theory of value at this point, it is a way of extracting rents from your investment in raw materials. Finance extends this logic to the production of debt-based financial instruments on which you can write puts and calls that allow you to lock in, to preserve and to accumulate the value of those instruments. 
One truly interesting question that I'd like to uh, throw out to my two colleagues is this. Do we think of the internet, the information-based economy, as an example of, in your terms, the extension of absolute surplus value because it is the assumption of leisure time into an activity of unpaid labor? Do we think of it in terms that might be associated with Negri as a commons that is being enclosed even though it was never owned? Or do we think of it rather as an abstraction of the financial mode of production in which options are being created, choices are being created that have variable value for people. Last summer, I gave five lectures in Kampala, Uganda on options theory, two of which were on higher education. And I wanted to describe in those lectures internet-based higher education, these massive online courses that were based on courses at my own university as essentially creating a market in education as a set of options that did not correspond to opportunities. They did not correspond to opportunities to graduate from the University of California or even to immigrate to California in order to apply to the University of California. But in Kampala, if you were going to graduate from the local university or a local for-profit and get a job with the government or an NGO or a foreign investment bank, the out-of-the-money option to get a B in Berkeley was worth a lot more than your McCrary University degree. So my question is whether or not the kinds of gradients, rankings, hierarchies, spreads, from which rents are being extracted is the model of financial production, which is different from the enclosure of a commons or the subsumption of leisure time into absolute value. So that may be a, 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 useful, a useful point of entry. And I have, I have much more of a talk to develop what I said last time in the finale uh, based on this kind of analysis. But I thought that stressing these points uh, would be a good opening for debate and discussion.